what do I do? I the leadership of the ruling party, the African National Congress. The last war, struck by lightning bolts in the dead of night, dazed and disorientated, grappling with the cauldron of emotions, struggling to new and nerve to bid farewell to an immortal, caught in the whirlwind, what do I do? I bleed a poem. When sadness and celebrations commingle, the body shudders, shakes, and implodes. Ancestral winds blow memories. The land heaves dreams of a future without you, Madiba. You are lodged in our memories. You tower over the world like a comet, leaving streaks of light for us to follow. We salute you. Madiba, Kala, Kazomo, Kangweko, Kantande, Kamguti, Kaketume, Kambelase, Kantemi. Got no time for grasses. Feed them to the pigs, Harold. With you because uh, our minds kind of operate in the same channels, uh, and and what we love is the incredible reality of scripture that most people sort of maintain a, at, at a lower level. They, they, they sort of stop at their, the point that they currently understand, and mm -hmm. they don't want to ascend into the heights and really begin to look at uh, uh, the story of the Bible as it appears in other dimensions. Let's just put it flatly. And the Bible is multidimensional. And I'm looking at Isaiah 14, <clears throat> where Isaiah documents Satan's fall. And Isaiah 14, 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high. And that ascending above the heights of the clouds, you know, and you, where is that? <laughs> it's another dimension, I believe. And I wanted to continue our discussion on the basis of uh, how we should perceive what God is doing for humanity. Obviously from a Christian perspective we should view everything that's happening and everything that has happened in, in the course of human history through the lens of the gospel of Christ because that's the point. The gospel of Christ is the reason, it's, it's, it's the story that's unfolding that we're all a part of. Yes. And, and it really begins, the, the, the beginning of the gospel narrative begins in the very beginning of Genesis. And, and it follows all the way through to the end of Revelation. And it's that story, it's the, most, it's the greatest story ever told. In fact, I, I'm, I contend that every story that has ever been told, every romantic story, every, every mythic, heroic story is fundamentally based on the gospel of Christ. Hmm. Because Christ is the, is the archetype of a hero. And, and, and he saves us, he saves mankind, he delivers us, and he restores us. And this is, you know, the foundation of my book is the fact that and so many Christians understand that Christ redeems us. They understand that we're redeemed in the cross and by the blood yeah. of Christ. And we're redeemed and, and, and we're, we're redeemed from condemnation with the dragon, by the way, not just some abstract condemnation. We're condemned with the enemies of God. And, and we begin that everybody begins in a state of enmity with God. And that's our problem, right? We're estranged from the family. Right. And he reconciles us back to the Father. And the, and the word reconciliation means to be brought back into friendship or to be brought back into the family, to be reconciled to the Father. So he redeems us and he reconciles us to the Father so that we might be restored to what was lost in Adam. And you know that word reconcile um, also has the meaning to change. We have been changed. Yes. And that change that's taken place in us is not visible in us yet, uh, except by, maybe by our works. But the actual change that's taken place, that reconciliation, is huge. It's, it is huge, and it's an internal change. It's a working of the Holy Spirit inside of us. But ultimately, it's also going to be an external change. Yeah. That's called the resurrection.
Right. And we're going to be, we're going to be, and the resurrection is a restoration of mankind back to the blueprint of what we were supposed to be in the beginning. And all of the defects that we have in, in, our, in our genes, in our, in, our, in our genomes, are going to be rectified. And we're going to be restored in Christ uh, and, and, and restored to what Adam was supposed to be in the beginning. Yeah. And that's the most exciting thing that you could possibly imagine because what that means is reconciliation with the Father. We're going to be back in the family. It's the, it's the parable of the prodigal son. The book, Timothy Alberino, is called Birthright. You know, as you're talking, uh, my eyes strayed down here to cover this book, Birthright, while you're talking about reconciliation. Those two ideas are two ideas really that are one idea. And that's That's exactly that. right. That's exactly, they are one idea because um, our birthright from the beginning, man was created, man wasn't created and then given a purpose. Mankind was created for a purpose. And, and, and I see the purpose of mankind as twofold. Number one, it was fellowship with the Father. That was the, yes. that's our primary purpose is fellowship with the Father. And that's what Adam had in the garden. Remember the Father, the, the, the Lord walked in the, in the cool of the day. He had fellowship with the Maker. And then the second purpose is a functional purpose. We were created to have authority, to have dominion of the earth, to govern the earth. Right. So we were created with, uh, for, to have fellowship with the Father as a son in the family, and then to govern the earth. That was our function, was to govern the earth. And so that's, and, and everything's, it's, it's all going full circle back to the beginning. The, this trajectory of, of history, the biblical narrative, takes us all the way back uh, to all of that being restored to us as it was intended from the beginning. And so, the, and so what is the birthright of mankind? The birthright of mankind is dominion of the earth. It's the mandate. It's the, it's the deed of the earth that was given to Adam and his yes. offspring to govern the earth. And, 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 and I take you, through, in this book, I take you through this, and I show you how, at the end of the age, from my perspective, at the end of the age, we lose the birthright. But there's a, even though, and, and this is a phrase I use in the book, because I talk about how at the end of the age, we're going into a post-human paradigm where there's scarcely going to be a human being left on the planet because of the transhumanism that's taking place, leading us into a post-human paradigm. And I make a case for that in the book. But even if there are no more human beings left on the earth to, to inherit the, the, the birthright of Adam, mm -hmm. there is still a son of man seated at the right hand of the Father. Wow. And he's going to return... Take, he's going to return, he's going to break the seals on the deed of the earth, come back and restore and, and win back what was lost for mankind. That's why I say he's the ultimate hero. Jesus is the hero of humanity. He's the greatest hero mankind has ever known. Greatest hero of the universe. Of the universe. And, and, and he is perfect, which my mind can't even deal with something perfect. I've, I've never uh, held in my hands something perfect, for example. Because we live in a, world, a kind of a broken world, if you will, where everything's just a little bit not quite, you know, could be better. Uh, but we're going to be, uh, if you will, reconciled, to use your word, into a perfect place. And we will be as he is, the Bible yeah. says. Yeah. We will be as he is. And so Jesus rising from the dead was the first fruits of those who would follow in the resurrection. So that is, I mean, I, again, I can't think of anything. There is literally no tale, no story, no mythology more exciting than the gospel of Christ. I, I have to totally agree with you. And in your book, uh, the things that you've done, uh, you've sort of brought the supernatural uh, into a forward position. In other words, the supernatural is not something to be ducked and, <laughs> and covered, and we'll talk about that later because it gets too complicated. It's not supposed to be that way. I think the Bible wants us to talk about the supernatural, and you've gone the extra step in, in birthright, and uh, you are to be congratulated, I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know, the supernatural is... is uh... When, when we talk about these things, we're, we're talking about something that is entirely natural to us and for us. And I believe that Adam in the beginning could perceive what I call the, 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 the dimensional totality of created order. And that's something that we've lost. And remember that, uh, I, I believe it's Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's Paul who says that in, in, after the resurrection, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see him as he is and be yes. seen by him. We're going to know him in a way in referring to Christ. So in other words... I talk about in the book that our, we have a problem right now. We have perceptual cataracts. Uh, 
And that's what Paul <laughs> says that we see yeah. through a glass dimly. That is precisely what cataracts is. It's a film over your eyes that inhibits you from, from seeing the, the totality of, of, of what's around you. So we, as a fallen species, we have, we have perceptual cataracts. But, but at the resurrection, those cataracts are going to be removed. And we're going to be able, I believe, to, to, to perceive the dimensional totality, the splendor, the full spectrum of the splendor of creation uh, as Adam was able to see and enjoy it before the fall. And the fascinating thing is that uh, God allowed a rebel, and, and he was a superior form of life, the dragon. It God allowed that rebel to do what he would, and, and I'm positive that God could have stopped him at any point. That theme really underlines so much of what's happening in the Bible, the fact that this rebellion happened. And, 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 and I believe it happened, I know there's some dispute around this, but I believe it happened before Adam was created, before Adam showed up on the scene. So Adam shows up in this context, in the context, in, in, in the in the aftermath yes. of, of, of rebellion, war, and ruin. And so there's this whole faction that exists. By the time Adam is, uh, appears on the stage, there's this whole faction that exists that is at war with God. And so Adam is, is being tempted and tested in the Garden of Eden. Whose side are you going to be on? Because remember, he's going to govern the earth. Right. He was created for fellowship in the family, fellowship with the Father, and to govern the earth. And so it was kind of a test. Whose side are you going to be on? Are you going to be loyal to the king, or are you going to, or are you going to throw your lot in with, with his adversaries, with his enemies? And, and this is really the, the struggle of mankind throughout the scriptures. Is, is the, the dragon is always, the devil is always tempting man to defy God, and, and God is always bringing, bringing us back to him, yeah. and ultimately redeems us and reconciles us and restores us. The thing that, uh, that amazes me is that we as, as human beings on planet Earth going about our daily life do everything we can to block out the, the truth of what's in this book, to block out the fact that there has been a rebellion, there is difficulty, there are uh, malevolent forces just behind the curtain, and that we need to put on the whole armor of God. And, and we, uh, as, as a species, uh, are not prone to follow the words of God. He offers his love and his, and his salvation. And, and we always, anyway, not always, but much of the time we say, uh, uh, sounds good, but later on, you know, get with me again in a couple of months and I'll let you know whether I want to take advantage of your offer. <clears throat> That's our usual uh, reaction because we don't know what's in this book. Exactly. <laughs> because even a lot of Christians struggle to understand the gospel, especially in you know postmodernism and, and how that's influenced yeah. Christianity. And uh, so, so many Christians think that the gospel of Christ is that we're supposed to just love each other, and it's and it has social implications, societal right. implications. That Christ, what he does is he fixes the world and and he makes society better. That's not the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the rectification of the human condition. It goes all the way back to Adam. It restores us to the Father. And so, and that's why, you know, Jesus didn't come and to fix the world. That's not what he did when he came. He came to redeem, he, to, to, to seek and save the lost and to redeem us so that we might be reconciled to the Father because he's going to come and establish his kingdom and change all of this anyway someday in the future. You know, Tim and I were talking before we, uh, we came on here and uh, I, I mentioned the magazine, the Prophecy Watcher, to him, and I suggested that he would he might contribute an article or two because I love the way he writes. Uh, if you'd like to get your copy of the Prophecy Watcher, here's how. Each month. Not me. I'm in my prime. In vino veritas. Agic ur agis. Creda Judaea sotella non ego. Eventus stultorum magister. In pace requiescata. 
Come on, boys. We don't want any trouble in here, not in any language. Bigger than that, it's and your book conveys that idea. It's galactic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rather, yeah. I guess you could call it that, or maybe intergalactic. Yeah, yeah, and it really is the scope. I think that um, we 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 just simply cannot comprehend the the scope of the biblical narrative. And that's and I think that's a good way to explain it. The scope of the Bible is not just human affairs and what's happening on Earth. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about uh, the, the, the cosmos of creation and, and, and our place within it. Yeah. And to understand our place within it, to understand what it means to be human is so critical. It's so much more critical today than it ever has been because in the future, I believe, we're, 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 going, to be, we're going to be selling our birthright for a bowl of stew. We're going to lose our humanity in the future. And the way that's going to happen is through the technologies and through the genetic modification, the, the human enhancement uh, products that are going to be hitting the market before long. And so we are headed towards a post-human paradigm in which, in which, in which we, shed, we shed Adam and we choose to consciously evolve ourselves into, some, into something else. And so the question is, what does it mean to be a human being and what, what are the implications of becoming something other than Adam. For, and, and the implications are we forfeit our birthright. And again, the, the, the title, birthright, you just heard Tim say it, we forfeit our birthright. But, you know, I was thinking as you're talking, we live in a really amazing era at this point with, with artificial intelligence, uh, with genetic manipulation. Uh, we can literally take God's created beings and turn them into trash. Corrupt them. Corrupt them. And the Bible speaks a lot about that corruption, which began with uh, a famous incident in the Garden of Eden. But it has not stopped. Satan still has his plan. That's right. And you can see the, 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 this conspiracy, this machination of the dragon through the scriptures from, from, from Genesis to Revelation in which he is, he, is, he is always trying to corrupt humanity and, 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 and even genetically. Right. Um, and that's where this is all headed ultimately because we are headed towards a post-human paradigm. It's, it, there's no way to stop it. It is inevitable. And so it is so important at this time in history that we understand the gospel of Christ because the gospel of Christ pertains to the offspring of Adam and only to the offspring of Adam in terms of the salvific implications of uh, Christ became us to save us. He's our kinsman redeemer. And so at this point in time, when we're on the cusp of an age in which men are no longer going to be human, we really have to be able to, to preach the gospel in a way that highlights this dynamic that Christ came to save the sons and daughters of Adam. He did not come to save you know, post-humans, right. hybrids, because when, yeah, this isn't science fiction. This is coming. And when, talk a little bit, bit about that. Hybrids, uh, transhumans, what are you really talking about here? Well, there's, right now there's, uh, there's, this, uh, there's this undercurrent happening um, that m some people are, are somewhat aware of, but it's, it's flowing at such a rapid pace right now, and it's dynamic. It's, it's, it's about to change everything, and it's called the genetic revolution. And it's, and it's not just genetics, but ge genetics is one of the things that's moving is very quickly. It's, it's a suite of bi biotechnologies that are rapidly developing that are going to converge. And when they converge, they are going to allow us to fundamentally change our biology, to become something other than human beings. And this is, the, and this is it's unprecedented. Um, there, is a, there is a biblical precedent, but the way yes. that this is happening, yeah. the, the specific way this is happening is unprecedented. And there's, you know, there's four primary streams of biotechnology that are going to converge, and there's other streams branching off of these, but the four primary ones are genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. And these are, these are sometimes referred to as the Grin technologies. And these technologies are all, are, are all um, developing at breakneck speed separately, but eventually they're going to converge. And that's why technologists and futurists call the age that we're in right now the hybrid age. And that, of course, that, that, that of course recalls to mind the, the first hybrid age in the pre-flood world with the yes. fall of the watchers and so forth. But we are literally in the hybrid age when yeah. these things come together, hybridize, and they're going to fundamentally change our 
what it means to be human. Slow down just a little bit because that might have, might have gone past some people where pre-flood, uh, there was a hybrid age. Sons of God came into the daughters of men and produced something that God never, never desired. Unsanctioned creatures that were never supposed, never intended to exist. These were the offspring of the of the watchers and 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 the daughters of men, and they copulated and procreated a hybrid race of entities. And 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 in the book, by the way, I des I, I I describe why I believe they did that because there was a plan. There was it wasn't haphazard. It wasn't just something that 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 uh, they weren't just driven by a desire to copulate with human women. They had a plan, and part of that plan was to usurp the birthright of Adam, and they did it before the before the flood. And I explain how that happens and, and why that happened, and they're going to do it again before the end of the age. So we're coming full circle. We are coming full circle. We the, the, in, we're going worthwhile to really have an understanding of where all this craziness is going. You look at it right now, and we're in an era of uh, upside down backwards politics, upward, uh, upside down and backward uh, economy. Uh, uh, our foreign relations are a big question mark. We have China. Uh, we have a number of things happening. Uh, and I didn't even mention Russia. You could get really confused and really upset uh, if you forget the goal who we are in Christ Jesus. That's right. And the prize. And, the, and our hope as believers, the resurrection and restoration, reconciliation with the Father. And that's really what, what grounds us as believers because no matter what happens, no matter what happens in this world or how things go, or we know that we know what the work of the cross has accomplished for us. Amen. And we, we run the race with endurance because, because if we... If we die believing in him, so shall we be, we be raised in him. And we're going to be like he is, which is absolutely amazing. And uh, we will see him for the first time. Exactly. Uh, that is, the eyes we have right now, I don't think can even comprehend who he is. <clears throat> no. I, th I think of the Apostle Paul. He had eye trouble. And he, uh, I think he prayed to the Lord, you know, he's a thorn in the flesh. I think that may have been his eye problems, and he had trouble seeing, and he wanted to see naturally. And the, the, the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. I'll carry you through, even with eye trouble. And uh, you know what? That's humanity. Humanity uh, has a new vision, but we can still have that eye trouble a little bit. Yeah, perceptual cataracts. <laughs> but I love what you've done with the book, and uh, we've got just a little over a minute now uh, to uh, close out. And uh, as you struggled to write this, and I, and I know exactly that it is a struggle, but because it, to do something as uh, as well put together as this book, you really have to work. Yeah. And and just a, a word or two to the audience about. Uh, What's in the book? Well, the book is very complex. As I said, it, it, it takes us all the way from a pre-Adamic paradigm all the way forward to the Battle of Armageddon. And it weaves together a bunch of very complex topics. I talk about, uh, I talk about the Watchers. I talk about the creation of mankind, the purpose of mankind, the Garden of Eden. I talk about the Watchers. I talk about UFOs and aliens. And I work my way all the way through the post-human paradigm and transhumanism and all of that, all the way to the return of Christ. So I cover a lot of ground in this book. Indeed you do. And I, I thank you for, uh, for being here. It's always exciting to talk, talk to you. Uh, uh, we, we connect on several levels. Likewise. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I think you said it right. We're on the same bandwidth. We're, we're, we're on the same frequency. <laughs> I'm fixing to commensurate this trial here. We gonna see if we can't come up with a verdict up in here.